the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Wolfin. I'm a partner in the corporate department at Mishcons, and I run our MTech program for early stage tech businesses. Today, I'm joined by four impressive names in the startup ecosystem, which include three founders of exciting companies currently on our MTech program. The panel will be discussing how early stage tech businesses are coming out of the crisis, what the landscape looks like, and what types of opportunities they can look to embrace. So to introduce them today, firstly, our chair for the session today is John Spindler. John is the CEO of Capital Enterprise and co-founder of the London Co-Investment Fund and AI Seed, and generally Mr. Startup London. We're also thrilled to have Sherry Kutu, CBE, uh, a serial entrepreneur, founder, and angel investor. She founded MTech Business, WorkFinder, as well as Founders for Schools, and chairs or has chaired Founders for Schools, WorkFinder, Raspberry Pi, Digital Boost, and the Scale-Up Institute. We've also got with us Sam Hussein, the founder and CEO of MTech Business, Log My Care, a software startup that aims to digitize and modernize the social care industry. And Camille Rougier is the co-founder and CEO of MTech Business, Plural AI, an AI fintech startup providing a knowledge-based search engine for the finance industry, which was founded from the prestigious Entrepreneur First Technology Startup Program. So I think without further ado, I will pass over to John Spindler. John. Yes, welcome everyone. We're going to talk about obviously the, you know, the subject matter of the day, which is obviously how are we all coping with COVID? And I'm going to get every one of the guys here to basically give a little description about their business a little bit more. What the last six months have been like, the good, the bad, maybe the ugly and, and what do they think coming out? Sam, how's it been since March? A little bit of background about us. Um, we, we provide software um, app and web based for social care industry. So that's uh, mostly care homes, but also uh, home care agencies. It's been a, a pretty crazy time to be in this industry and, and also in tech. There were suddenly things that needed to be entered, you know, ways our system could be used to help manage the pandemic, which we had to quickly adapt to. In the, those first two, three weeks, um, we were just releasing features and sort of pausing other stuff and just focusing on how can we help our, our customers survive this really. And then going forward, obviously it's six months now, how have you got on? Broadly speaking, like we've, we've more than doubled in size in terms of number of customers. And that's partly thankfully because the government has propped up the social care sector. So luckily for us, the customer's still there and the need for, uh, for systems like ours actually increased in the time. On that note, I'm going to go to Sherry and get her to tell us about her six months experience. Well, um, again, they sort of span different, different industries. If I um, think about two, you know, one of them founders for schools, uh, and, you know, the schools did not uh, happen any longer. And so it's an events business that puts founders into schools. So that uh, was a, you know, caused a, a rapid move towards the adoption of technology. Um, uh, think about WorkFinder, which starts out by putting students into workplaces and now it's all remote work experience places. And that was actually pretty, that was pretty simple because students were already, university students were already used to being mobile. Um, digital Boost is another one where we're retraining adults so that they understand how to use digital tools. And um, I can tell you there's an incredible desire to use digital tools in order to figure out how to serve your customers online. Um, on the bad, I think relationships are harder. You know, in the old world, we would wander around. Uh, you could read someone's body language. You could read a thousand t t things by just looking at how somebody's sitting at their desk. And as a leader manager, I observe people and that helps me you know, know how I can help. So that's harder for me to know how I can help. And then I think that's one of the things that we can do as founders together is support each other in, well, what best practice are you, are you discovering? Okay, yeah. let's come to our last speaker, Camille. So Camille, mm -hmm. tell me about the next six, six months and what, you, what your adventure has been and, and the things you've attempted to do in this time. It's actually the fundraising landscape is looking pretty good for startups, funny enough, even though it didn't look like that six months ago. So we were, we, we kind of came into the pandemic. We didn't, we were quite a small team. We were quite lean because we're still very early stage. And when the whole COVID thing started, we we're like, okay, let's just pause hiring. Let's make sure that we, we've got what we need to survive. And so we didn't necessarily need money. But then the, when the government announced the future fund program at the you know, turn of the summer, 
that my existing investors uh, were actually like, hey, let's just put some some more money in this tent. Let's take advantage of that. That was really interesting because I ended up closing a round of funding. We would have been able to carry on everything, but we would have kind of like, you know, had to survive and be a lot more, a lot more careful about what we did. Whereas now we've got, you know, we've kind of ended up validating a lot of our assumptions. And then we've got the firepower to then go and hire great people. And then that's another good opportunity is that there are lots of really good people on the market for, for startups. And for those of you who don't know, John was instrumental in um, in getting the Future Fund approved. And, and um, tell us a little bit of, from your experience about how that's worked out. Because, I mean, one of the reasons why I feel quite positive from speaking to so many startups is that it does feel that for certain startups, the landscape in terms of investments, pretty positive. In ter- as anyone will tell you in, in startups, I did the least important, but the necessary wrote. I wrote the initial blog that said we needed a convertible note fund backed by government to mean companies like Camille would not run out of cash until the end of 21, 22. And that inspired uh, basically people to back a single scheme, which would basically, at the time we called it the runway fund that became the future fund and lobbying the British Business Bank, the Treasury, speaking to Rishi Sunak and all of that, to say that we did not want basically the next six to nine months for this to be an enormous kind of uh, to a basically crisis for people who are running out of capital in that period who won't be able to raise any more because the natural thing will be retreat to safety. And what it has done has basically saved a generation of startups. It's kicked the can down for people like Camille to get to get more time to get to product market fit. Obviously, we may have created a problem in 21, 22 because it will be all out raising capital. And Sherry, is that you? Because of course you wear so many hats as Johnson to begin with. On investor and investee side, do you, does that sort of chime with you? Um, well, particularly, I was thinking actually on the investor side. I, I think it's an absolute gift to investors. It will be like I think you know, uh, you know, a snake swallowing a piano as you as you try <laughs> to work this work this through the through the system. Um, you know, there'll be uh, you know the next thing we'll see as well. They will all need follow on funding. Those are good problems to have, and it's better than losing a losing a generation. Tech is a net job creator. And actually, if you have money at this stage in the environment today, one of the big things is you can get amazing talent. Obviously, one of the big groups is going to be these young students and young people coming out. I mean, are you seeing that basically the tech scene is okay, uh, is absorbing some of that, is a great route for these people? WorkFinder gets people re- ready for permanent employment. So it's pre-permanent employment. And what we're trying to do is get people who are at university or doing their PhDs, a bunch of different internships and different things. And if you're a startup, you know, I've often got three or four projects that I want to get done, but I don't have permanent roles. So filling non-permanent roles, it's perfect. It's a fabulous growth hack for anybody in, in you know, in the, in the early stage in particular. So, yeah, no, I think it's been a, for us, it's been a blessing for sure particularly not having to physically go into an office. Like for small companies, one of the barriers was, well, we've got rented office equipment. We can't handle, you know, where are you going to put 10 people who are going to help us with this project? And it's like, you don't have any of Zoom. <laughs> They're going to work from their bedrooms. I mean, I, you know, I'm working with people right now in Seattle and in Hong Kong, you know, they're doing amazing work. And, you know, you know, one of them goes to sleep and the other one starts up. And, you know, when you happen to be awake, lo- loads of stuff is coming in and projects are going ahead at an incredible rate. Sam, over to you, because you have onboarded people in this period. It has been a lot easier hiring. It's There's no two ways about it. We've had just hundreds of applications per role. It's completely changed how we, we kind of moved to a very much, obviously remote, but um, we, we kind of use screening calls to kind of get that, that fit. Um, tick box uh, kind of ticked very early on. You know, in, in the people we'd hired before, we'd found that was so important to not just hire people that we're going to get on with, but know that who are going to, they're going to buy into the vision. We've had to be a lot more conscious of what someone is going to experience in their first few weeks. Is normally you pick up a lot of the background and the history of a company and um, what the company is striving to do. And you pick that up in an office by just being there. And now we're having to kind of think about that and have that as another part of, you know, another tick box on the onboarding. Companies that have good, good culture, you know, have a strong culture, a strong work culture, are finding it a lot easier to adapt and those and, and to onboard than those that don't. That's the only thing that you've got left, right? You don't have the free, the free coffee and, and fruit in the office and the fancy digs and stuff like that. So all you've got is you know, what ties you to the culture of the company. Okay, I want to kind of move on a little bit on this kind of issue because it struck me 
about a week or two ago, even the vaccines here, we're going to still have to have social distancing measures for quite a period of time afterwards. But this is now getting to be the new normal. And I, I'm, I'm going to say, what have you adapted? What's good about this? What does it enable you to do? Or are you still going to struggle with the adaption? I mean, for us, it kind of validated one aspect of our business model, which is software that's going to change a business. Um, can be implemented remotely and when I was starting the business everyone was telling me like this sector needs you to go in and physically show people I, I kind of dramatic, quite deliberately set up the business not like that and was just like well let's see if this works and so luckily that's something that's really been validated is that the trend is towards much more digital interactions than human ones i mean one of the big problems i've got with a lot of my start especially the b2b is top of the funnel problems how do yeah. they reach basic new clients and how more importantly do they establish trust so they will use their product how are mm. you tackling that trying to generate as much real content as we can like from our own customers so it's not just us speaking it's a it's videos testimonials reviews um and having that very authentic feedback um the more real it is, the, the more we felt that we've been able to get that trust through. What are you seeing, Sherry, on this top of the funnel approach? I think it's largely the same. And I like to go in um, via influencers and in collaboration with, with incumbents and co-create things that they need and that their customers need. So for me, it's been the same. You still need to earn the trust. You still need to focus and make the product you know, very, very significantly better. I think it's been easier to get um, time with, with people um, possibly because they're not commuting and so they, they've got time to think about, um, you know, new, new innovations. I think there's been an improved ability to get to people that you want, that, that you know, the decision makers that you want to make, make decisions. I think there's a broader <laughs> point here, that, which is like, there is a trend just more generally. It's less about the, the chummy relationships and the drinks that you go in and, and there's a kind of a whole host of companies that are very product-led companies and maybe that's kind of accelerated that a little bit where you know you can't really you can't need to take them out for a drink and the, your product is going to have to stand on its own and as a result you kind of have a much more I guess authentic um, relationship with your customers the last thing you want is to have to really kind of hoodwink them and you know, promise them something that it's not so you want them to be excited you want them to be kind of talking themselves into using the product not the other way around so I want to look at the future now and I'm, I'm basically, and you're all optimists. And I want you to kind of inspire people a little bit about the next six months to a year. What are you seeing in tech? What are you, what's giving you hope? I mean, if, if things go super well, then it's it's sweeping modernization. Um, it's hitting the news a lot more in the NH, NHS, the sort of rate at which, you know, fax machines and things are, are getting abolished now. and and the NHS is moving into the 21st century, but I, you know, I hope that uh, trickles down or, or is also shared across social care. I love some of the things that I've seen, uh, you know, if I think about Coursera, LinkedIn, FutureLearn, they are absolutely rising to this challenge of helping, helping adults re learn how to do stuff very, very differently. I love that we're able to have short stackable credentials and we can learn Python over here, over university. I can zip over to Stanford. I can learn something about machine learning. I can go over here and I can learn Scrum and Agile technologies. I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in ed tech. I spend a lot of time in, uh, in financial services as well. I think that the release of talent and the retraining of the talent so that it's adapted and capable of being absorbed by us startups is awesome. Are you hiring more people globally from everywhere? We do need the government to make it a little bit easier for us to employ, or employ people in other countries. That would be a good gift uh, for, the, for the government and the home office to give us. It is still harder than it should be uh, in particular to employ talent from other countries. Something that's been really interesting coming back to some of the, the points that Sherry made earlier around culture and the fact that you have to be, it has to be a lot more written, a lot more documented. There's some really interesting trends that are coming out of how do you represent and interact with knowledge when you, you can't share and have a conversation with people? How do you create artifacts that allow people to manipulate and you know share and represent certain concepts that are very abstract and that you would only be able to get by just mingling with someone? So I think it's going to be a really interesting transformation that and that thing will be sweeping across media, across politics across business and knowledge work in particular. So I find that's going to be really interesting to see. 
I think, I think this is going to be a fascinating thing, a, a period of the next six, 12 months. I think tech is, is by far the best place industry to kind of tackle some of these issues. I, I share your view, and that's why we did this in the first place, which is that um, there is much we wasn't about, but we're going to have to leave it there. So a big thank you to um, everyone who attended. A big thank you in particular to John for facilitating, and of course to Camille uh, and Sam and Sherry. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.